Hello and welcome to Growing Boulder Headquarters. I'm Mark Middleton, your host for a special show coming to you live from two continents presented alongside our partners at the National Senior Games Association. Growing Boulder and the NSGA are totally aligned in our belief that the many health and well-being benefits of participating in organized sports are important for people of all ages. Together, we're now creating opportunities for athletes over 50 and then sharing their example to inspire others. We're helping redefine what's possible for all of us as we age. Of course, 2022 is a big year when it comes to sharing the stories of older athletes, and not just because the National Senior Games are back after a one-year pandemic postponement. They'll take place in Fort Lauderdale in, uh, Fort Lauderdale in May, but also because 2022 marks the 50-year anniversary of the passing of Title IX. That's the law that prevented federally funded education programs and activities from discriminating on the basis of sex. Title IX jump-started a seismic shift in American life with a far-reaching impact on just about every part of our society. And today, we're gonna focus primarily on opportunities in organized sports. Title IX paved the way for the impact and the inspiration of athletes like Serena Williams, Mia Hamm, uh, Danica Patrick, Vin, uh, Lindsey Vaughn, Simone Biles, and many, many more. In fact, here's a dramatic before and after that illustrates the law's history. Before Title IX, the only sport even offered to women in a majority of schools was cheerleading. In total, less than 1% of all high school athletes were female. And at the collegiate level, there were less than 30,000 female athletes nationwide. Only one in 27 girls played sports. Then, in 1972, Congress passed Title IX, paving the way for women's sports programs and ushering in what would be a sea change in opportunities for women and in expectations and what they can achieve. Today, 50 years later, two in five girls now play sports. Female participation at the high school level is up over 1,000% and up over 600% in college. And in the 50 plus demographic, millions of women now participate in organized sports with over 6,000 competing in the 2019 National Senior Games with even more expected this May in Fort Lauderdale. In just a few moments, we'll speak with Catherine Switzer who is a pioneer. She defied societal barriers and she became the first woman ever to run in the Boston Marathon. We'll also welcome a panel of successful senior athletes who missed out on their chance at high school sports but they are now seizing their opportunity to compete in master sports at National Senior Games. But first, let's check in with a man who was leading the National Senior Games Association, the CEO, Mark Riker. And Mark, I understand today you're not in your office in Clearwater. You're actually down in Fort Lauderdale getting ready for the games. That is true, Mark. And uh, actually, Spun, actually, uh, one of our participants in the panel here is actually in our office today, and so is Dell. So, but I'm right in Fort Lauderdale doing a site visit, getting ready for the games here in May, May 10th to the 23rd with a bunch of our team members. So we're really excited. But today, it's really about all these wonderful women that I have here to showcase. And we're just so proud from the National Senior Games because we've consistently you know, promoted gender equality. And that was from the very beginning. Uh, the founders who set up that first board of leadership they made sure that half of the members on that board were female. And also the sports that we've offered from the beginning, the sports and the events have always been the same. It's been offered for the men and been offered for the women. So that's always been an exciting thing. But really what's great now is that if you look at the anniversary here of Title IX, and we think about the senior games move, it really has the most active female athletes from the pre-Title IX and transitional era than any of any organization. We were seeing Julia Hawkins at 105 was running down the track. Uh, the other thing is that we're just so grateful that we can share some of these stories and appreciate where society has come you know, through all this. And I think that's the key to this whole thing. And really the last thing you know, from the National Senior Games, we're just very thankful and humble for a lot of the, the women who are grateful that the Senior Games have provided them that opportunity. From a lot of them, they say it was... Uh, their second chance to compete in competitive sports. And as Mark mentioned early on, we had almost 6,000 of our athletes competing in the 2019 National Senior Games in Albuquerque. And we look to see those numbers continue to grow. So really without further ado, let's, let's get to the stars of today. And uh, thank you, Mark, for uh, leading us through this. No, you know, Mark, I appreciate that. And I think you have sold yourself a little bit short when you mentioned that you're only 
offering a second chance for these great athletes because you're also offering a first chance for many people who didn't think they could do what they're now doing now. So uh, kudos to you guys and thanks for all that you do. All right. Uh, you know, the National Senior Games is not just about uh, sports. It's about socialization. Uh, it's about getting together. It's about your better health. And, and it's been proven that women and that girls who participate in sports have less osteoporosis. They have less obesity. They have better heart health. Psychologically, they have a better body image. Their self-confidence and self-esteem is, is improved. They do better in business. Uh, these are just part of the many fruits of Title IX and the benefits of participating in the National Senior Games. All right. Uh, and now no one would know more about that. No one would know more about uh, the benefits to, to these athletes than the National Senior Games Association Media and Communications Director, Del Moon, AKA the Storyteller. Uh, this guy's been telling these stories for decades. Del, what is the NSGA doing this year when it comes to Title IX? Well, we, we recognized very early that we had the largest collection of active women and we have to hear their voices and we need to honor them. We need to take these pioneers and show, especially young girls today, what they went through and when the shoulders of the, of the giants that they stand on. So we wanted to get this program together as early in the year as we could. We, uh, I reached out to some people that I knew to come in and, and tell some of these stories. And uh, we're actually gonna take it another step. We've prepared a survey and we're going to email out to all 65 plus female athletes the opportunity for them to answer this survey. We're going to sort through that and then we're going to come back and do another one of these a little bit later this year. If we can get it done in time, we may do a couple of things at the games, but we're thinking about maybe doing another thing like this and bring out some brand new people that I don't even know yet and, and hear their stories and, 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 and their iteration of what this is about. because. It's, it's not just one experience. Um, you know, some girls wanted to do it and, and couldn't. Some girls were just told you shouldn't do it or you're not good for that, so you shouldn't do it. So they never even thought about doing it. So there's lots and lots of different colorations into the, into the types of stories and the types of experiences. And I'm really looking forward to seeing, and I'm talking to you out there, ladies, answer the survey. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Dale. It is a great research group. In fact, all of these studies that show that, you know, by design, we have to decline as we age. We're done with populations of largely sedentary people. And now that we have this group of senior athletes in, in the National Senior Games Association and Master Sports, there's an entirely new group that we are learning from, and they are proving, they are dispelling all of these myths. All right. Talking about dispelling myths smashing stereotypes. It's now my pleasure to introduce a true pioneer and a trailblazer in women's sports history. Her name is Catherine Switzer. She's the one back in 1967 who became the first woman ever to officially register and run the Boston Marathon, finishing the race despite the fact that a man charged onto the course and tried to physically remove her from the competition, as you can see from this iconic photograph. This moment in sports history would inspire countless female athletes worldwide, and it continues to have major ripples even today. Now, Catherine wasn't done. She would go on to become the winner of the 1974 New York City Marathon. She's been inducted into the National Women's Hall of Fame and the National Distance Running Hall of Fame. She's the founder of the Avon Running Global Women's Circuit, which has created events in 27 countries for over a million female runners. She's a best-selling author. She's an Emmy Award-winning TV commentator, uh, and she is just one, one wonderful person to know. Joining us now from her home in New Zealand is Catherine Switzer. Catherine, I can't do the math on the time change, but it, it, what, what time is it there? Very early in the morning? Very early in the morning. I've got my coffee right here. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Mark, thank you for that introduction. It's wonderful to be here today all the way from New Zealand. Yeah, it's pretty early in the morning. Uh, hey, one quick thing. I wasn't the first woman to run the Boston Marathon ever. I was the first woman to officially register and run the Boston Marathon, the first woman to wear bib numbers. And that's why that angry official who is a race director ran out on the course and tried to rip those, those bib numbers. There it is. Rip those bib numbers off of me and throw me out of the race because I was a girl. And so that was uh, the, the beginning of my life story, if you see what I mean. <laughs> uh, I, I want to get to the race uh, in a second, but two things. First of all, is that actually the iconic bid number 261 or is that a reproduction? 
That's the one a you, reproduction. That's I, I do, a re I, I, I do have the originals. I'm not going to tell you where they are. Uh, it's probably <laughs> in the Smithsonian, or it should well, be. Well, they've, right. asked, they've asked for them, but I'm not sure I want them to go there because I, I want them you know, to be seen. You know, I don't want them in a basement someplace. All right. But, we're, we're, we're going to get to your glorious act of rebellion in just a moment. But 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 I know to some extent that the seeds of that rebellion, Catherine, were planted by your father uh, the day you came home and told him that you wanted to be a cheerleader. Can you tell us a little bit about that day? Yeah. You know, Mark, it's a very important story. And I think it's it's one I start all my speeches with because I think um, people should really know how important it is to be a role model and encourage your kids because they're sensitive. They get their noses broken really easy. Um, and, and they need all the encouragement and opportunity you can give them. And I had asked, I said to my dad, I'm, you know, skinny little 12 year old that when I went to high school the next year, I was going to be a cheerleader. And he said, oh, honey, you don't want to do that. He said, cheerleaders cheer for other people. You want people to cheer for you. Mm -hmm. The game is on the field. And you know how lucky I was that our high school in Fairfax County, Virginia, uh, very progressive, you know, wealthy area. Um, it, it, they had a field hockey team for, for girls. And um, I, I'd never heard of the sport before and neither had my dad, but he said, I know they run. And if you ran a mile a day, you'd be the best player on that team. Mm. <laughs> he was a very motivating guy. <laughs> and so I, I believed that. And I went out and I started running this mile a day and, and that changed my life. Not because it made me a good athlete. It changed my life because it empowered me. And that's what really, you know, the, the whole, the whole um, aspect of Title IX is also about. It's not only about giving the opportunity and saying to women, you have the opportunity, you can do this. They, they have the sports experience. And as every woman at the sen National Senior Games presented by Humana will tell you that the sports experience has empowered her, mm -hmm. uplifted her, transformed her both physically and emotionally and mentally to do other things she never thought she could do before. And I think that that's why sports for women is so very, very important. Well, for all of us, but for women, especially because for thousands of years, we haven't had that opportunity. We are all transformed by the power of example. And, you know, after running, as you you, you said, in cro cross country, you went to Syracuse, which had no women's cross country team, but you were allowed back then to practice with the men. Uh, and that experience led to the idea uh, of running as a registered runner uh, at Boston, correct? Well, that, that was kind of a, a, a joke. The, the coach at the, of the Syracuse team never thought I would show up. So that's, that's the important other thing about, I think every woman athlete will tell you, is show up. You never know what's going to happen until you show up. And usually you get a good result. So I showed up. And the other amazing thing is, is that maybe male athletes in running were completely different from uh, other sports, but these guys were wonderful to me. They showed me a lot of respect. If I was willing to do the work, you know, I was one of the team as far as they were concerned. And so I really trained hard and uh, a volunteer coach was there who was an ex marathoner. And he was the one who kind of really took me under his wing. And we began running every day. And he would tell me stories about the, the day in his life he felt like a hero, which was the Boston Marathon. And he was, a, he was just a little guy who was a you know mailman. And, and, but the Boston Marathon meant everything to him. And I told him I wanted to run it. And he said, oh, no, a woman couldn't possibly run that far. And I said, I know I can do it. And he said, I tell you what, if you showed me in practice, I'd be the first person to take you to Boston. So that was that was the bet. And we ran 31 miles one day and he passed out at the end of the workout. <laughs> and so after that, he said, you have to register for the race. That's It's a serious race. You don't just go and show up. And so I signed the entry form and I signed my name, KV Switzer. They thought K was a guy. I got my bibs. And um, when I showed up at the starting line, again, the guys were wonderful. Um, but the official caught me at about a mile and a half and he didn't like me at all. <laughs> Let's talk about that moment, because the fact that you did what you did is amazing. But but let, let's be honest. It's kind of like the old saying, if a. Uh, uh, if a tree falls in a forest and nobody's there to, you know, do, do we hear it or whatever that saying is, uh, if you had done what you had done and there hadn't have been a press truck that just happened to pass by and take this photo and several others around there, would the impact have been as great? And, and when this happened, as you said, less than two miles into the race, you can obviously see you're stressed, you're frustrated. Did you think about quitting or did it make you determined to, to continue? 
Listen, you know, I was a 20 year old girl and this was not a political act. My coach insisted that I sign up for the race because it, it you have to be official. It's a serious race. I was, I was a member of the AAU, you know, track and field federation. Um, and so when this happened, I was terrified. I really was terrified. I, I really, um, I didn't know what to do. I felt like I had somehow screwed up a, a really major event somehow. And my coach just looked at me afterwards and, and, I, and I said, listen, Arnie, I'm going to finish this race on my hands and my knees if I have to. Because I knew if I didn't finish the race, first of all, I'd regret it the rest of my life. And I knew I could finish it. You know, I'd trained hard. But I also knew that other women w uh, would not believe a woman could do it unless I finished. And, um, and that's what everybody wanted me to do was to quit. So I really, really had to finish. And it, the pressure was enormous. And, um, but I just sucked it up and just said, okay, you know, this is what I'm going to do. I, I often call that my two, six, one moment, you know, the moment when you feel the fear and you got to make the decision and the decision was to finish it. And, you know, as I say, it was only 20. Uh, and I often say that when I first ran that Boston marathon, I started it as a girl, but I finished it as a grown woman because it gave me a, a real life plan. And that life plan was to somehow create opportunities for other women to run. And what a joy it was to, to spend my rest of my life really doing that, but also you know, helping to champion the cause of getting the women's marathon into the Olympic games in 1984 and to be there for title IX and to be there even in 1972 back at Boston when we, the same year as title IX by the way, where we championed women finally to be official mm. in the Boston marathon. It's, it's been an amazing story, but you know what? It has been nothing less, Mark, than a social revolution. And you, that was alluded to at the beginning of how Title IX has changed things. But it has created, women's sports has, in the United States especially, has created a social revolution. It's changed many, many lives in many, many ways. And it, it's, you know, rising tide lifts all ships. It, has, it is going global now. And again, we'll continue to do that. Well, thank you for finishing the race. It took you, uh, I think, four hours and 20 minutes to do that. Uh, four hours and 20 minutes uh, to change hundreds of years of sexist thinking, to change not just what society believed about what uh, was possible for women, but, but as you know, Catherine, uh, to change what women believe about themselves. How long after the race did you begin to feel the ripples? How long after the race uh, did you start to see that photograph? How long after the race did you begin to realize uh, what the heck you had done? Well, we just thought it was a weird incident. We just thought that, that Jock Semple was a weird guy and, and he did have a short fuse. And it wasn't until about midnight when we were driving home uh, back to Syracuse from Boston, we stopped for some ice cream and coffee to wake up and um, all the newspapers in the, in the newsstand had the picture. So we had this moment of like about eight hours of total blissful ignorance. And then it really, by the time I got to the campus at the university, it was just everywhere. So I, I knew then that, that when I saw it in the newspapers, it was really gonna change my life. It wasn't just, just some weird little incident. I had, I had no idea up to that point. And um, yeah, that, that, <laughs> that was, it, it's a photograph, interestingly enough, that's become one of the most galvanizing photos in women's rights history as well as in sports history. So, I, you know, I'm fortunate to have that. Um, but at the time, it was the worst thing that ever happened to me in my life. Um, and over the years, it's become the best thing that ever happened mm. to me in my life. Well, not only one of the most galvanizing photos in sports history, it is one of the greatest moments uh, in sports history authored by a 20 year old woman who just wanted to do her thing. Uh, and we're all grateful for that. Catherine, uh, would you stick around for a second? Because I'd like to bring you back in in a moment and, and have you you know, chat with our panel. But 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 let's bring in now really four more female athletes for a round table of inspiration. Now, these are all women who grew up before the passing of Title IX. And as a result, they missed out on the opportunities that exist today. Uh, and in some cases, like Catherine, but perhaps not quite as dramatically, they had to create their own opportunities in their younger years. But thanks to the National Senior Games Association, to Master Sports in general, they are now able to enjoy the many, many benefits of engaging in organized sports. So let's bring them in. We have with us today, 
Alice Tim, a former professional tennis player and college tennis coach and a member of the Intercollegiate Tennis Association Hall of Fame. We've got Diet Sawyer, a multi-time National Senior Games medal-winning swimmer. She's a member of the Texas Senior Games Hall of Fame. We've got Lorene Hildebrand, another multi-time medal winner who competes in as many as 17 events at the National Senior Games. She is a multi-sporter, but best known now for her pickleball prowess. And we've got Joe Dill, who has uh, been a National Senior Games competitor since, uh, since 2005 in basketball, bowling, and now, hallelujah, finally, we've got Cornhole. Uh, she also <laughs> serves as the coordinator for the Main State Senior Games. Uh, ladies, welcome to you all. Thank you. It's great to have you. Who, who remembers the Boston Marathon from 1967? You know, I think we all of our age look back and say, we remember when Kennedy was assassinated. We remembered when we landed on the moon. Do you guys remember the Boston Marathon from 1967? And did you realize what was happening? I was playing tennis overseas, so that wasn't on my radar. How about yes, you? I, re I remember it. I remember it well. And how did it impact you? How long How long afterwards did any of you realize that, that things were going to change? And when you realized they were changing, uh, were you excited or were you frustrated that, that they were changing too late? I think that we were a part of the change. I, I mean, I don't think you can depend on someone else to live your dream. You have to make it happen yourself. And that certainly happened for me going to the University of Florida where there was no tennis team when I went. So I started one. And, and to this day, there's super athletes, super. I brought my hat even for my Florida Gators. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, so you, you started uh, a team at the University of Florida, Alice, when there was none uh, before Title IX. You had to have encountered some resistance. Well, it wasn't so much resistance, it simply didn't exist. The, those opportunities weren't there, but Maureen Conley came to uh, Peoria, Illinois and gave a clinic and I took one look at her and that's who I wanted to be. I wanted to be a tennis player. So then I went to the university and Florida State had a team. It had been a women's university, so they had a team and, and Fortunately, the University of Florida was willing to do it. We didn't have any sponsorship or coaches or help of any kind, but now they do. And thank you to Title IX, it's a law. Amen. Diet Sawyer, uh, can, I, can I tell folks your age? Certainly. 80 years old. Uh, you might be the perfect example of a young girl who loves sports, but gave them up in middle school because... You know, you thought, and our culture certainly reinforced that thought, that girls your age just didn't continue playing sports. And and for you, the consequences were devastating. You became sedentary, uh, overweight, out of shape, and, and, and unhealthy. I mean, it truly changed your life when you had to stop sports. Thankfully, you were able to get back into them. Can you talk about uh, the frustration of having to quit sports after high school? Well, I, I, I can only take responsibility for it that, I bought the message in the deep South that women just did not compete. And it had been a big part of my early childhood because I went to an all girls school and there we could do anything we wanted. And uh, then I transferred into a public school and I was ridiculed for uh, wanting to play sports and, and continuing to play sports. And so it didn't take long for me to want to be accepted and I adjusted and I let go of one of the things I love most in my life. And I, I just became a cheerleader and a, and a bystander, you know, to watching all the events instead of participating. And, and uh, I, I so wish I could go back and talk to that, that young girl that was me and, and tell her what was possible and what was coming and, you know, and, and it was, it was a, a great sadness, but, Boy, did I not have any idea of what was to come. I had no, my senior years have been unbelievable. And it's fulfillment of dreams I had as that young girl. So, so tell us about that, because you did find swimming later in life. Uh, 
And I think it's probably fair to say, based upon what I know about your life, that it actually saved your life. It did. How, how bad were you? What was the turning point? Well, I was talking to a woman at, at my fitness club and she mentioned that she had done shot put in the senior Olympics, senior games. And I said, what? I'd never heard of anything like that. And when she told me, I went, something went off and I said, I've got to find a sport I can do in the games. I, you know, and um, I tried shot put and I threw my shoulder out and then I decided they put up a poster that they were going to start a swim team at our club. And I showed up the very first day and I couldn't swim half a pool. And if it hadn't been for an incredible young coach, it was her first day coaching. Uh, she would not let me quit. She said, I can teach you. You can do this. And uh, it, it changed my life. A, a few years after uh, starting swimming, I had a complete workup done. And they told me that my heart had severe blockages. I had, uh, I had lived a hard life. I mean, I had been addicted to several substances and I was um, just, I did everything damaging to myself and my health that you could probably do. Uh, swimming gave me a whole new focus. And when I went back for a, a checkup with the doctor years, uh, a couple of years later, he said that everything had changed and that I was 100% okay, and that I didn't even need to ever come back to him as long as I maintained the lifestyle that I was in, living now. So swimming did literally save my life. They had told me that within five years, I was going to have an event and a heart event. Well, uh, you know, I actually happened to bump into to Diet on the deck at the U.S. National Law Course uh, Masters Championships outside of Cleveland late last year. And uh, Deanne, I paid attention to what you did, and I know that you won uh, the 800-meter freestyle. So not only did you come back, you've come all the way back. Congratulations. The most exciting thing about that moment is still to come. In April or May, they announced the World Championship. And I have a very good chance of being first in the world. And, and who could have dreamed that? Who could have dreamed it? Never too late. Uh, uh, anyway, I'm, I check every day to see if it's been announced. They they said it wasn't going to be announced until April or May. Uh, how exciting. We'll look forward <laughs> it to it. It was number one in the United States of America. That's pretty good. <laughs> All right, Lorraine, let's, let's talk a little bit about Title IX because, as we mentioned, it was about discrimination in all of the educational programs, not just sports. Uh, you grew up on a farm in Ohio. As a young girl, you had dreams of becoming a research scientist when girls were encouraged to study home economics and learn how to square dance instead of studying chemistry. How hard was it for you to overcome what had to be significant prevailing sexist bias at that time when you wanted to do something that was considered to be the domain of men? Yes, that was, all, that was in my life all the way up. Uh, in our research scientist building, we had 400 chemists, uh, chemical engineers, physicists, and there were four women out of all of those. I mean, it was a very minority, and it was uh, either the guys liked you or they hated you. There hardly was any in between. It was all... Uh, you had to prove yourself to be better than them. And I did. And that's how it went all my life. And I had that from the very beginning. Yes, the, the research, but it was it was good because that was my that's all I liked was science when I was a kid. I was born that way. I liked logic and uh, discrimination was uh, terrible in my my thoughts because, it, if I only wanted fairness, I only wanted people to be kind to each other, whatever their talents are. And yes, I experienced that all through my life. I was I was raised with four brothers, three of them were older, so it was very comp uh, competitive. No matter what I did, yeah. you know, it's, you know, it's amazing that. Um, 
you know, the excuse that many schools gave for not allowing women to, to study manly subjects to pursue sports like men is that women weren't interested in that. And, you know, it's been proven that, that, that interest really is a byproduct of, of exposure. And, and I think that's what Title IX was about. It was just mandating uh, that universities that receive public funding had an obligation uh, to expose women to things uh, and to not be controlled by the bias, the, the stereotypical bias, the, the, the genderism that, that was out there. Uh, so it's amazing. So, so thank you for doing that. And Joe, you played sports in, in high school, but not in college because there were no sports in college back then for, for, for women. So you majored in, in health and PE. How frustrating was it for you to be relegated to the sidelines when you still wanted to be on the field? Oh, it's extremely frustrating. Uh, starting in in starting in middle school or junior high, as, as it was called back then, when there was a a, a boys basketball team, but the and the coach was paid. There was nothing for the women. And one of our teachers said um, was a trailblazer herself. Said it wasn't fair, and she immediately went to the principal and got a basketball team going for women. And um, we played, we had no uniforms. We actually played what, what I've learned to now, if you look in that top picture, it's called a onesie. <laughs> and if you can see the ball up there, the ball was huge. It was, it was men's, it was men's ball. When I got to high school, the same thing happened. We could play uh, basketball. We had one uniform. We played in the auditorium because uh, the boys had the, the gymnasium and it just seemed like it was a battle all the way through. And even in uh, when I went to college, the same thing happened. There was nothing for um, women there, whereas the men had basketball, baseball, soccer, wrestling, whatever. So we played a lot of intramurals. We, we tried real hard to get someone to let us have a team, and the best we could do was intramurals. Mm. But um, sports really... I, you know, they say everything you know you learned in kindergarten, but I really felt everything I learned was in sports, um, sportsmanship and how to be a leader and teamwork and, and so forth. And it's really, um, it's been my lifelong mission, uh, taught, taught health and physical education and coached for, for 40 years. Well, and you know it was, what? Yeah. No, I, I was just going to say, at Growing Boulder, we talk a lot about moving forward and giving back. And, and obviously, the, the point of our discussion today was that, um, you know, back in the day, no one was really helping young girls get into sports. But but you today are actively, Joe, helping older adults uh, as the coordinator of the main senior games. What's it like to help older women who never had the opportunity, uh, you know, get into sports for a second time or get into sports for the first time? That's got to be richly rewarding for you. Oh, it is extremely rewarding. And when I first took the job to myself, I said, my main goal is to get as many women involved as possible. Not that I didn't want more men involved, but that I wanted uh, more women involved, women like myself who who maybe played in the high school, but that was it and never had the chance. Or they got married right away and had tons of kids or they were discouraged. Um, you said that uh, earlier, you said that, that women might, the feeling was that women weren't interested in it, but we, they also felt we weren't capable. Mm. For example, I could dribble three times I couldn't go across the center line because I, you know, heaven forbid I might fall down. Um, so it, it, when I first came on, we had 30% men, 70% women in the main senior games. And right now we are, we're pretty even. It's still a little bit more, but we're pretty, we're pretty even. But it's just been, it's a thrill to find these women who will email me and say, this is the first time I've had a chance to participate since high school. It's just a real feel-good situation. It's wonderful. Well, thank, thank you for doing that. And as we mentioned, Title IX uh, eventually had major impact on, on coaching as well, you know, creating opportunities for women at the collegiate level. And, uh, and Alice, uh, you started coaching right after Title IX, um, you know, as you, as you mentioned, and you were immediately successful, but, but 
uh, your resources, your paycheck certainly didn't reflect that. It took the coach after you to file a lawsuit. Uh, and then I understand you moved on to Yale uh, and the coach before you had filed a lawsuit. So finally, at that point, you were being rewarded. But despite the fact that Title IX existed, it took lawsuits uh, to, to make many of these things happen. How, how was it like? What was it like being a coach at that time? Well, again, there was tremendous opportunity um, at the University of Tennessee, Chattanooga, where I started the first team. Uh, we had wonderful players and, and there was an opportunity. It's just that they didn't financially reward. I mean, we used to stay in, well, we camped sometimes because we didn't have the money for motels. And then when they went to the nationals, because we won the nationals three consecutive years, they had to come up with the money for the girls to travel. But again, it, it was an opportunity for everyone. I think they learned a lot about leadership and it, it certainly reinforced that if you don't do it, nobody else is going to, that you have to do it yourself. And then when I had the opportunity to go to Yale, Yale had established a, a, a equality for women and we had equal opportunity for the courts. I mean, it was, it was terrific. By the way, I brought my Yale hat as well, <laughs> not to be left out, my Yale tennis hat. Um, I, I, I think all of this was an opportunity for leadership for women, and, and they did a really good job of it. My teams have reunions every year. They're wonderful women who, who do great things in this country. So uh, again, it's 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 up to you to live your dream. It's not up to somebody else. We still have a long ways to go, folks. Hey, Mark, uh, I want to yeah. say one more thing about about the opportunity for for women. There there was opportunity. The United States Tennis Association had tournaments for girls, and they had Junior Whiteman Cup. That's what I had the opportunity. It's true, it wasn't in schools. But there were associations that gave great opportunity and still do for women to play tennis all over the world. So tennis may be an exception, but but I, I you know I, I certainly wouldn't want them not to be not to be rewarded for offering it. Well, you know, I appreciate that. And I think to this day, tennis probably is an exception because I think the women on the tour, and forgive me if I'm getting this wrong, are probably paid closer to the men in professional tennis than, than most sports. Uh, I do know that in uh, in golf, the LP, the average salary of an LPGA player today is about $45,000. The average sal salary of a PGA player is one point. $2 million. So, you know, th th there is still a big discrepancy. But speaking of the ripples of Title IX, they continue to affect things that are going on. Breaking news just today, and I want to get your reaction to this if you have, uh, have any, uh, a six-year fight over equal yeah. pay between members of the World Cup winning U.S. women's soccer team yeah. and U.S. soccer, the sports national governing body, ended today. Uh, the two have finally agreed on a settlement, which will now pay $24 million to the players. Uh, and U.S. soccer is committing to providing an equal rate of pay going forward for both the women and the men's team. Uh, uh, long time overdue. Any reaction from any of you on this news? I, I think pickleball has parity now with That's women and men. I think Sorry. it's an important, it's a very important uh, action that has been taken. Yeah, Thanks. absolutely. Yeah, I say that's progress, that we finally have some progress that's uh, that's defined. Well, you know, it, it's, I, I read something recently that we all have some blame. A lot of people blame the media on women not being paid as much because the, the media doesn't televise women's sports to the extent. And when they do, they don't put the production resources behind it. There's two cameras instead of six cameras. Uh, you know, they, they don't do as good a job and all it would take is more exposure. So, uh, you know, we're committed as, as a media company to sharing the stories of of people of all ages, of all genders, uh, you know, as we move forward, because I think we all have to you know, take some of the blame. The, the interesting thing is this to me. I mean, there's many interesting things about Title IX, but Title IX, as it relates to sports, basically says that the proportion of women on campus 
uh, has to be reflected by the proportion of women with athletic scholarships. 60% of people on most campuses now are women, uh, and yet 90% of all colleges are not in compliance by that standard. And to this day, 50 days after the passing of Title IX, there has not been one uh, uh, penalty uh, against any college for not complying with Title IX. They just say they're in compliance, but working to resolve differences. And, uh, you know, and that bugs us. So I think we all have to, to keep talking about this as we go forward. Let's bring Catherine Switzer back in uh, for, for a bow and a bow, if you will. You know, you know, Catherine, thank you again. Uh, and help us do put a bow on this discussion. And let me ask all of you the same question to give you a chance to, to answer it. And Catherine, let's begin with you. You know, what's the moral of this story? And maybe, you know, outside of Title IX and outside of sports in general, but, you know, what's, what's the takeaway? What can we all learn about life in general uh, fr from what each of you have experienced? Catherine? Uh, oh, so many things. It's, it's, it's that opportunity is everything. And when you're talking about the um, lawsuit being settled today for the soccer team, I must say, when people say, well, you know, it, we, we don't see it enough on television and television won't cover it because nobody is watching. Well, when you pay people and you pay the professionals, um, they'll watch it. They will cover it. You know, it'll be it'll be on the news. Billie Jean King told us that. You know, everybody said when, when, when they started the Professional Women's Tennis Association, everybody said, oh, nobody's going to watch women's tennis. Women don't deserve to be paid, la, 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 la. Well, I argue that women's tennis is just as popular as men's tennis, maybe even more popular. And soccer will be the same. They're, they're different. It's the same sport, but they play a different game, and it's fascinating, okay? And, and the coverage will come, and that is very, very important. But I think the takeaway also is this, is that, Sports is for everybody, and, and it, it, it defies gender, and it is all about diversity, inclusion, and equality, and respect. These are things that we have learned, uh, and that the National Senior Games presented by Humana are a wonderful opportunity for everybody at any age to, to reclaim their, their, the athlete within. I think all of us uh, look at this event with great, great joy, and aspiration. So many women I have met only started running at 65, 70, or even 75. Um, they don't they don't know about all the problems we had before because they were busy with jobs and kids and the dog in the house uh, and the husband maybe. <laughs> and, and, and suddenly they say, it's my time. I can be an athlete. I think the other thing to realize is that it's really never too late to start, that the body always remembers, the body always wants to get better. Um, and that we have this opportunity in May, and I wish everybody would be there and experience the great good health and the great opportunities it gives us. Well said. I, I think as a panel host, I made a, a fundamental error, ladies, by asking Catherine Switzer to go first. Uh, she is a tough <laughs> act to follow, uh, uh, but somebody has got to do it. Diet, jump in there. What's the takeaway for you? What's, what, what have you learned about life in general that we should know? I'd like to say something in my life. I think the takeaway is listening to the stories of every woman here and saying that women couldn't be stopped, that it, they, they were not willing to let life go by without participating and, and participating in a mighty way. And that's been the history of women throughout the ages. Um, but the senior games just gives, you know, it just puts icing on the cake. It just offers that that thing that brightens your senior years to, uh, I don't know. I, I still can't get over it. I can't even, I, I've never gotten over the thrill of being part of it. Um, and I don't plan to. Amen. Lor uh, Lorraine. Can I say I'll, something? Yeah, please do. Oh, okay. Uh, I just want to. I just want to embellish that a little bit too. The yep. fact that uh, I didn't start sports earlier because there wasn't any sports earlier. Right. But when I, after I retired, which I retired early from, from the research center, uh, I got into sports. I got into them because of the national senior games. And it's the national senior games that is putting women more on the map than anything. Because little by little, you can get the people come to you after they see the, that you are doing different sports and they want to be like you in very many ways. And that has promoted them tremendously. 
Amen. Thank you for that. Joe, how about you? What's your takeaway? Oh, it's never too late. It's never too late. That And the other one is the song that we used to sing before we went into a basketball tournament. I am woman, hear me roar. So <laughs> <laughs> we're coming. I, 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 I think Alice is going to roar for a second. Alice, you're the, anchor, you're the anchor lady here. Bring us home. Well, I, I wrote my master's thesis on the thoroughbred horse farms. Uh, the land It was a land use study. And one of the things that I learned, despite the fact that they pay huge sums of money for the stud fee, yeah. the heart comes from the mayor. Hmm. And I think if you want a society that's really strong, yes. you have to have women be an integral part of that society. And certainly the senior games has done that for all of us seniors, and we owe it to all the young people to bring them in as well. And I think women have done a good job of that, have done a really good job of that, but it's not over. It's gotta be a law. And thank you, Mark, and thank you to the senior games. Right, stick around, we're not over yet. Before we do say goodbye uh, to our panel, I wanna thank all of our viewers uh, who are watching on Facebook, YouTube, uh, and Twitch. We will archive this entire program. We'll share a link on growingbolder.com so you can watch it again, share with your family and friends, and not just the program, but most especially the message, the inspiration, the historical significance of Catherine Switzer and Title IX. All right, Catherine, Alice, Diet, Lorraine, Joe, are you guys still around? I, I just want to thank you for your inspiration. And, you know, one of the cool things about Master Sports is we know how old you all are. Uh, you know, we, we see the age groups that, 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 that you enter. And one of the cool things is that when we get to be this age and as successful as you are, you, you don't mind people sharing your age. So I will tell you folks that everybody you're looking at is somewhere between the age of 76 and, and early 80s. And, you know, your inspiration is extremely powerful. And, you know, I, I just can't thank you enough uh, for, for all of that. And so thank you for hanging out. Uh, you all know the satisfaction of, you know, of having the opportunity to do what you do. Uh, uh, thanks to organizations like the National Senior Games and and we will be there. I hope you are all there. We will look for each and every one of you at the National Senior Games. Let's so have dinner. You. Let's have dinner. Let's do it. Yeah, you know, that'd be super. Uh, I look forward to that. All right. Thanks, ladies. And before we go, let's check back with Del Moon if we can, if he's still hanging around. Del is the Media Communications Director for the National Senior Games Association. Uh, Del, the impact of Title IX and the NSGA on women's lives can't be overstated. We just heard it with our own ears. What else are you doing this year to celebrate Title IX and women in sports? Because I know you never stop. <laughs> well, the, the most important thing to us was that the stories that we have to share come from before the, all of the change. So we needed to be out first to share these stories. And we're gonna come back again later this year and share more of those stories with the survey I mentioned earlier. We will ask our 65 plus women to share their stories. We'll pick the best of them. And thanks to your wonderful production and great, you know, uh, interviewing skills and such, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll do more of this. But I think what's most important here is that that comes out of it for me, because I went through this period too. And I had a different attitude when I was 15. And once the change happened, I saw and understood what this equality was all about. And I've appreciated over time that in society, we have to be, we have to be equal. We have to have equal opportunity. You know, it's, if there's two, humanity is made of two wings, a male and a female. And if one wing is, is weak, then the bird doesn't fly. So I'm, I'm just, I consider myself very fortunate to, to know these ladies and to be working for this organization that is demonstrating this equality and, and, and proving it. And, and I, I can only imagine, you know, how great it will be in 20 or 30 years to see what the composition of these games are, what games they'll be playing. And they'll be talking about the pioneers, the people that were here today. The Dell Moon, uh, among others. You know, uh, I, I love your business mission, Dell and Mark Riker. What you guys are doing is amazing. Uh, I know the heart that you have for the business mission. So, so thank you so much for that. Uh, we, we are proud and honored to be a part of what you do. And 
you know, let's wrap it up with this, folks. You know, women have always had aspiration and ability, but really what they lacked, as we've heard today, is just opportunity. Uh, and that did change in a big way back in 1972 with Title IX. And, and as we've mentioned, sports was only part of that transformation. Before then, it was common for women to become teachers and nurses, uh, but not principals and doctors. And today, 80% of all female managers of Fortune 500 companies do have a sports background. That's how powerful this is. In 1970, men earned eight times as many PhDs as women. There weren't many people like Loran back then. Today, women earn more doctorates than men do. And, you know, once all but shut out of medical and dental and, and law schools, women now outnumber the men. Title IX initially focused on what happens in the classroom, but that focus very quickly shifted to what's happening on the playing field. And now it's changing uh, the way that we think about sex differences, about gender roles, about sexuality in general. It shifted to dealing with sexual harassment because back in the day, there really was no such thing because boys would be boys. Title IX was not perfect. Today, it is not without controversy, but no piece of legislation passed in our country in the last 100 years other than the right to vote has affected more women than Title IX. No matter what might happen to Title IX in the future, the remarkable achievements of women and girls will never be reversed. A profound cultural shift begun back in the 1960s in the hearts and the minds of women like Catherine Switzer led to Title IX, which ushered in a sea change in expectations of what women can achieve. And thanks to organizations like the National Senior Games Association, what they can continue to achieve in their 50s, in their 60s, in their 70s, in their 80s, in their 90s, and even their 100s. To learn more about the National Senior Games Association, to be inspired by the stories of older athletes, just go to nsga.com and growingbolder.com slash NSGA. And please subscribe to our podcast. It's called Fountain of Youth. Every week, we interview masters athletes in all sports who share their amazing stories. And by example, they're delivering a playbook for active longevity, for happy and healthy aging. And as Catherine said, as Diet echoed join us in fort lauderdale where we will be producing live daily wrap-up shows from the 2022 national senior games beginning in may 11th and i will leave you with the words of the irish playwright george bernard shaw who said quote we don't stop playing because we grow old we grow old because we stop playing we'll see you